Coming up on Market to Market, Mother Nature puts the brakes on planting in the Midwest. And we'll look at how rural and urban interests balance growing crops and treating drinking water. Those stories and market analysis with Elaine Cub next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, June 19 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The Federal Reserve Board noted this week key segments of the economy, including jobs, new home construction, and consumer spending are all improving. According to the Commerce Department, housing starts, a critical indicator of economic strength, fell 11.1 percent last month. Despite the drop, new home construction is still 6 percent higher than a year ago. The Labor Department reported this week the consumer price index rose four-tenths of a percent. When the volatile food and energy sectors are removed, core CPI was up a modest one-tenth of a percent. The Conference Board's Index of Leading Economic Indicators, another gauge of the economy's strength, was up seven-tenths of a percent in May. And while the Federal Reserve gave the economy good marks, they decided to leave interest rates alone. Farmers in the Midwest saw a spring season with moderate conditions and adequate rains. But recent severe weather patterns have curtailed planting in some parts of the grain belt, forcing a few producers to pack it in. And the spigot doesn't look like it will be shut off anytime soon, as parts of the region have been soaked by the second tropical storm of the season. Tropical Storm Bill blasted the Texas coast and continued north to the southern plains this week, dumping nearly a foot of rain in some places as it moved north into Oklahoma and Arkansas. An additional three to eight inches of rain is expected in the region by week's end. The map of weekly precipitation totals from IntelliCast reveals a soggy corn belt from Missouri through Ohio and into Pennsylvania. Rainfall has helped crops already in the ground, but not all acres are planted. This map, completed with data from USDA and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, discloses a wide swath of unplanted corn. The states shown in red have more than 100,000 acres left to plant based on information from June 7th. Missouri and Kansas have the most outstanding acres. The progress on soybean planting is even more dire. The states in red are way behind on soybean planting. Missouri made a 12 percentage point progression in a week, but seed for more than 3 million acres remains in the shed and not in the ground. Missouri produces almost 7% of the nation's soybeans, ranking fifth in U.S. production. Those plants that are up have endured a wet spring. The National Weather Service reports the month of May was the wettest in the continental U.S. since record-keeping started in 1895. However, some portions of the country would gladly take the excess water. The latest drought map from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln indicates a band of dryness has developed from the Ohio Valley to the Carolinas, including much of Kentucky. However, the overall drought level dipped below 40 for the first time since July 19, 2011. Drinking water warnings due to high nitrate levels are not uncommon for those living in the Corn Belt. The finger pointing over the source of those nitrates has been going on for decades. Runoff from farm fields, livestock operations, suburban lawns and broken sewer pipes have all been listed as contributors. Farther down Big Muddy's path, the runoff cocktail converges in a 6,000 square mile area in the Gulf of Mexico known as the dead zone. The brew consumes oxygen dissolved in the water to the detriment of marine life. Further upstream, municipalities deal with the increased nitrate levels in different ways. Some issue warnings, while others treat the water and send the problem further downstream. No single answer to the problem exists. Farmers are working with state governments to avoid more restrictive rules, and at least one municipality has taken legal action. Josh Bittner explains. Conservation could be considered a basic tenet of modern agriculture. And while the well-worn concept is being adopted voluntarily throughout portions of rural America, some have kept a watchful eye on the environmental impact of farming 
for generations. We've just kind of taken it upon ourselves uh, to be stewards of the land. We realize that the time that we're here is really just a very short period and, and it's been important to my family. Custodial practices like no-till and cover crops help hold soil together, minimizing erosion. In turn, nutrients crucial for successful yields are more easily retained on the 1,700 acres David Osberger farms near Jefferson, Iowa. Really a nice root mass of cover crops here. You can see some of the residue from previous crops and it just uh, slowly decays over time. The, the earthworms pull it down, the bacteria breaks it down, uh, converts it into organic material and that organic material is food for microbes and they actually produce nitrogen. So some of what's going down uh, to Des Moines is the byproduct of a natural process. Agricultural runoff is a hot button issue in the Hawkeye State these days. So that motion passes. Earlier this year, Des Moines Water Works sued the boards of supervisors in three counties upstream. The case alleges drainage districts adjacent to Osberger's home county are allowing excess nitrates from farm fertilizers to flow into the Raccoon River, a major source of clean water for customers in and around the state's capital city. This lawsuit, while it was kind of a, a slap in the face, might do some good as far as really getting people's attention and saying, hey, we, we do need to make a change here. We're not going to be prescriptive in what we think should be happening on the land. We just believe when that pipe discharges into the waters of the state uh, that it should be water that we're able to process for safe human consumption. With nitrate concentrations at the kinds of levels that we've seen, that's not the case. Under the Safe Water Drinking Act, nitrate concentrations cannot exceed 10 milligrams per liter. Formed by the breakdown of nitrogen, consuming water fouled by the pollutant can be harmful to pregnant women and deadly to infants. The state of Iowa adopted its nutrient reduction strategy in 2013, which aims to reduce agricultural pollutants by 45 percent. A blend of efforts like cover crops, buffer strips, and wetlands are outlined. Some funds are available to help kickstart implementation, but participation is voluntary though some argue initial expenditures pay for themselves through nutrient retention on farm fields. However, with no deadline for meeting its goals, Des Moines Water Works claims the state's strategy is ineffective, citing high nitrate levels in its source waters again this year. And in order to comply with federal guidelines, the urban utility says record-setting operation of its aging nitrate removal facility, often referred to as the largest of its kind in the world, is necessary. The charges leveled against Sac, Calhoun, and Buena Vista counties declare violation of the Federal Clean Water Act by failure to acquire the proper permits for what is described as point source pollution. Agriculture is currently defined as a non-point source, but some fear unprecedented legal action may give way to intrusive regulations across the nation, but not before long, drawn-out litigation takes place. Waterworks officials say legal costs pale in comparison to the estimated $183 million a new facility would cost. But representatives of the agricultural sector maintain that sound environmental practices are still the best bet. Boy, you could envision all kinds of appeals depending on which side you're on and, and it's, it's frustrating, but it's, it's also why we're so focused on the solutions because at the end of the day, farmers have to be focused on the management of their soil, their water, and their nutrients anyway. Roger Wolf is the Director of Environmental Programs and Services at the Iowa Soybean Association. The nonprofit group promotes sustainable conservation practices which help farmers improve their bottom line. With its own certified and accredited water testing laboratory at its central Iowa headquarters, ISA collects data on nutrient flows throughout the state. And while information points to fluctuating nitrate levels in the Raccoon River, Wolf says a decade's worth of evidence shows fewer nutrients overall being delivered downstream. But he is quick to point out findings by Des Moines Water Works in the same watershed are not necessarily at odds with those of his organization. I wouldn't say it's conflicting. I, what I would say is, is that our numbers uh, document trends 
And, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at a snapshot in time. For nearly 20 years, the Iowa Soybean Association collaborated with the state's largest water utility on environmental issues. And while disappointed by the current lawsuit, Wolf says ties to Des Moines Water Works were severed after Bill Stowe took over. You know, I'd characterize it almost as a divorce. I will be the first to tell you that we have terminated a number of those so-called partnerships in the past realistically because we did not believe as a partner that we were getting a return on our investment. While grievances mount on both sides of the issue, leaders of Iowa's agricultural community point to an example being set in the state's second largest city, Cedar Rapids. The Middle Cedar Partnership Project is a cooperative effort of 16 different partners um, utilizing funding that's available through the, the recent uh, Farm Bill and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. In total, over $4 million in technical and financial assistance will allow Cedar Rapids Water Division to team up with farmers in the Cedar River watershed to minimize nutrients from runoff. The utility has yet to battle the nitrate levels Des Moines Water Works has been facing. We don't necessarily have a, a system in place to remove nitrates, so what we're, what we're doing is we're monitoring and detecting the levels prior to uh, the water coming into the plant. While measures in the Cedar Valley are largely preventive, they may be the best prescription for an area susceptible to major flood events. We're a, a very food processing, biotech intensive community. So our relationship to our watershed, to a, a source of a lot of the raw supply that's utilized in various industries in Cedar Rapids takes place in the Cedar River watershed. Some hail the City of Five Seasons plan as the preeminent alternative to the water woes of Iowa's capital city. But drawing comparisons is a difficult task. They're very different watersheds. The drainage patterns are different. The level of organic matter in the soil is different. The topography is different. And the variations don't end there. Cedar Rapids furnishes clean drinking water for about 130,000 people a fraction of the half a million residents Des Moines provides for. Des Moines Water Works draws from the surfaces of two rivers, the Des Moines and Raccoon, while an alluvial aquifer below the Cedar River is the drinking water source for Iowa's second largest municipality. Both of us are interested in safe water. That's the bottom line. The Middle Cedar Partnership does offer promise for urban-rural teamwork across the state and the nation. But in the end, solutions, either in the courtroom or the field, won't be a quick fix. I think that farmers in general are really cognizant of the, the fact that in the face of lower crop prices that we can't be losing those nutrients. So it's, it's, it's going to happen, but it's going to take a little time. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Treatment of the Midwest and South by the remnants of Tropical Storm Bill, along with pressure from unplanted acres, made for mixed grain markets this week. For the week, July wheat was down 15 cents, while the nearby corn contract was less than a penny higher. The news that almost 10 million soybean acres might go fallow this year pushed the July contract up by 32 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with a rally of 570 per ton. In the softs, July cotton declined 75 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, July Class 3 milk futures lost 87 cents. In the livestock sector, prices moved lower as the August cattle contract fell 13 cents. Nearby feeders declined by 3 cents. And the July lean hog contract gave up $2.90. In the currency markets, the euro gained one basis point against the U.S. dollar. Crude oil decreased 43 cents per barrel. Comex Gold rallied by more than $22 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell almost six points to settle at 432 even. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Elaine Cub. Elaine, welcome back. Good to be here. It was an exciting week in a lot of the row crop agriculture markets, both corn and soybeans, but it doesn't seem like wheat got invited to the party. 
Well, I think you could make the argument that wheat is in a very classic weather market, but just not United States weather, because yes, absolutely, the weather in the United States or the condition of wheat in the United States is bullish. Less than half of the winter wheat has been rated good to excellent, and the harvest is way behind pace, and there's lots of things that you could say bullishly for wheat that the market doesn't respond to. But I believe that the investment money that's flowing into or out of wheat on any given day is driving itself based on an overall global El Nino pattern, which means that Australia's wheat has been planted in dry conditions, it has continued to be dry, and then not so coincidentally, right when they received a forecast for some rain this week, that's when we saw wheat prices pull back this week. So I think it's a weather market, it's just not a U.S. weather market. Now how much of this downward pressure in wheat was caused by spread selling, buying beans, buying corn, selling wheat? Is that a, is that a typical move for these uh, institutional investors? It might be, but I, I don't think that we'd see very much of that pattern right now. I think that the behavior of the investment, the speculator side of the market, if they're getting into or out of the grain commodities, they're probably being driven by their outlook for the U.S. dollar, and that should affect the entire sector together rather than these um, intermarket spread trades. So given that we're in Australia planting in the dust, presumably then bins will bust, as the saying goes, and elsewhere around the world we're looking at a good setup for wheat, where, where do you expect these wheat prices to go here through the remainder of the U.S. harvest? Well, I, I'm not very bullish for wheat prices, and if you just look historically, seasonally, there's not some great opportunity historically to, to store wheat and sell it later in the year. Oftentimes you're just going to have to take your harvest price and that's going to be as about as good as you can get. Um, on the other hand, this El Nino, you say plant in, the plant in the dust and bins will bust, that's one outlook. But the Australian Meteorological Organization and the J Japanese Meteorological Organization are suggesting that El Nino is not dissipating. It's, in fact, it's getting stronger and will last longer. So there is a chance that you would get a rally in for the winter wheat varieties. On the other hand, for spring wheat, where the conditions don't have this U.S. bullishness at all, I think if, if you get a rally up past 575 again, we should be selling these rallies. Now, you mentioned the El Nino effect, and the reason that could present a bullish factor later on is... The U.S. Midwest will see typically more moisture in an El Nino year. Australia sees drought. oftentimes yes. drought conditions. Yes, that's, so that could impact that's the That's the thinking, wheat. yeah. But all it's right. very hard to predict. El Nino, I mean, this is all a guessing game, really. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, now as we jump down into the corn market, um, didn't fall as wheat did, stayed relatively steady on the week. As you look at old crop corn, what should producers be doing today given a relatively stagnant market? I think they should be very seriously thinking logistically about their supplies. These are not very appealing prices. However, if you don't have infinite amounts of storage that you can store multiple years worth of production in a bin, you're going to have to be bringing some of this grain to town. So I think you have to be thinking very hard about getting the bins cleaned out this summer and, and not necessarily seeing a, a July rally like we have in the short supply years because this is not a short supply year. What have you been seeing on the basis level nationwide? Yeah, they're quite strong. I mean, some of the processors here in the middle of the Corn Belt in Iowa, we've got some positive basis numbers at the processor level. So uh, that's roughly seasonal. Um, nothing too extraordinary on the basis side, really. All right. Well, now, as we look to new crop, what, what's your advice to producers watching that corn in the field, ponding, or in some parts of this country, uh, growing beautifully? Yeah, um, again, that's that's very hard to to know to, or to predict what the effect will be on yield ultimately. Even if we were in laboratory settings, we don't really know uh, how sitting in moisture or sitting in, in water affects a corn plant's yield in a perfect laboratory setting. And in the Corn Belt, this is not a perfect laboratory setting. So whether it's from leaching the nitrogen or actually suffocating the plants, how much of any given field or how much of any given state has been affected by this flooding, it's very, very difficult to put a number on that. So it's very difficult to really formulate how bullish a producer should be on new crop prices. The market, I believe, is starting to pay attention to this and understand that, particularly looking at the timing of the corn rally this week, what little rally it did earlier in the week. It was right on Tuesday, right after the crop conditions report, the crop progress report that showed the conditions coming down by one percentage point. So that suggests that, that the market is paying attention to these fundamentals and it's very possible next week and in the ensuing weeks, once we see the corn plants dying, those condition ratings will continue to come down. All right. Now, as we look at this soybean market, you mentioned in a lab experience with, with corn, we don't know what wet corn can do, but we do have a pretty good idea on what unplanted beans do. <laughs> yield-wise. Yes, yes. And there is still a batch of unplanted beans out there. As we saw on Tuesday, that crop progress report came out, beans took off. Is there still room to move upwards? 
yes, I believe there's still room to move upwards um, because there's still uncertainty. There could be people planting today in theory, except that the areas that are that you've shown earlier in this show that were least planted, they're the 10 percentage points behind the average pace, they were still wet again this week. So there probably hasn't been much progress made even since then. Um, so, so there's still, I believe, uh, opportunities for the market to continue to price this in. I think it's still uncertain and it was waiting for confirmation, but there will be confirmation in coming days, coming weeks, and certainly confirmation in the June 30th acreage report. Now, as we look ahead, uh, Saturday the 20th is the prevent plant date for soybeans on a large number of those acres that have been very wet. What should producers be considering if they're weighing prevent plant versus put a crop in after? Well, in a lot of years, or in recent years, where you would get some sort of profitable production, even if you have suboptimal yields or a suboptimal planting date, I'd say you put the, put, the, put the crop in and see what you can get for it. But 2015 is a special situation because penciling this out, you're not really looking at a profitable venture here. So behaviorally, farmers will always tend to plant a field. That's just what they do for a living. But economically, here is an opportunity to say, no, I won't plant. I will have a no-go decision and perhaps receive a, a crop insurance check for that. And that may be the economically logical thing to do here. All right, something each producer should weigh as yeah. they go out there. Now, as we jump down into the livestock markets, so let's talk about this live cattle market. We're, we're, we saw some change in the basis two weeks ago. Uh, this week, cash trade, uh, relatively small, and the board, futures price, relatively unchanged. Yeah. What does that tell you as you analyze a market? Elaine? Well, I think that this is the price, this kind of 150 level, uh, or at least between 145 and 155 is basically the price because there are bullish factors. We see the cattle on feed report came out today um, that was roughly in line with last month's report, so 1% higher. Uh, so these are slightly bullish things, but the bullishness has already been priced in and there's just not much room for it to go higher, particularly on the export side. The price of retail beef, we can't push that very much higher. So it's just, I, I believe the market will be be kind of stuck at this price level. Now, does the uh, there's been a lot of news about Cool, the country of origin labeling in the news lately. Would a change on that have an impact on this beef market? Do you think if they repealed Cool, should we anticipate any market reaction? I don't necessarily think that that's a problem just because of the, the trade patterns of, of where the beef in America is coming from. But the international export patterns, we're already seeing Brazil export beef to China, for instance. So I believe there's going to be continued pressure on our ability to export beef. That's not a cool consideration, but it's along those same lines of, of America's beef remaining in America's market and maybe not receiving so much space in external markets. Okay. Now, as we look at the feeder cattle market, we've seen uh, some tremendous profitability for cow-calf producers. And we've got a question here from Pat in Gretna, Nebraska. Uh, Pat is curious, looking out a little farther, what's your thought on feeder cattle markets into next fall? Well, I think that the feeder cattle market, looking at the structure of the futures prices right now, has already decided that the summer is the time when these prices are going to be most hot. And we've seen the trend going up. The August contract is 222 level. These are very great prices, but they, they, they stagger off as you go towards the October contract. They're, they're cheaper. And I think that's because of, I believe it's because of the, the great prospects for pasture conditions right now. We're seeing better pasture condition ratings in the, in the last crop progress report than we have seen for years, honestly, on a nationwide level. So I think that makes people very excited about buying uh, feeder cattle in the short term, but you know, slumping off as we go farther into the fall. For the cow-calf producer who's maybe expanded their herd, bought some high-priced cows here this year, should they be looking to sell feeders, do you think, into 2016 or even 2017 based on these prices that we're looking at today? I, yeah, I don't think that the, the herd is going to expand so quickly that these prices are going to fall apart in, in the very short term or even in the next year or 18 months, let's say. I believe that these, these opportunities will probably stay in place just because of the nature of the, the industry. We can't expand that quickly. So probably just hold on and yeah. just watch the market. I don't think it was a bad idea to expand. I, if, you, if you have new uh, production to, to bring online, I believe you'll still have these opportunities, hopefully. Okay. Now, as we look at this lean hog market, it has been volatile recently. We put in that summer high up around $84 and change. We've sold off more than $10 now, closed the week at $73.82 here in the, uh, in the August contract. Elaine, is there, is it going to be a continued slide to the downward? Possibly. I mean, we might have seen some support at those March lows, but I think we've gone through them. So now, you know, where are we going to put support prices on this market? Really hard to say. Again, structurally, we, we slacken off as you go towards the, the fall. You've got prices of $64, $65. So 
uh, yeah, there's, there's not, you know, with cattle, there are bullish things that we can say about the market. It just doesn't have room to go. With the pork market, there's really not a lot of bullish things we can say. There's just overwhelming supply. Um, we saw very large weekly slaughter numbers this week. That is likely to continue, particularly into the fall. So, you know, I believe there's bearish aspects of the of the hog market, yeah. And we're going to have export pressure with this continued high U.S. dollar. Yes, absolutely. Where do you see the dollar going in the short term, Elaine, th through the rest of the summer, for example? Well, in the very near term, as in Monday, if we had the Greek banks actually not being op able to open up on Monday, which is a a possibility, the, the market has not been overreacting to that possibility this week, but on Monday, it's theoretically possible that we could get something very strange going on in the outside markets and that would send the dollar going much higher because you have a lot of loss of confidence in the euro which is the only real um, you know alternative to the dollar for parking money but aside from that assuming that Greek get Greece gets sorted out and they're looking for an extension for folks that are watching the news this weekend that's the the key phrase for yeah. not spiking the dollar higher uh, assuming that that gets sorted out uh, the dollar still has some bullish factors, the, the prospect of an interest rate rise that is still probably maybe going to happen in 2015, listening to the Federal Reserve Board, um, and just the general improvement of the U.S. economy. However, I think that those bullish factors have hopefully already been priced in, and we're going to see the dollar continue along this price level where it's at right now, and hopefully we're not going to see another big rally, another big push in the dollar that threatens grain. And come back to just trading fundamentals. Hopefully. And Fingers the crossed. the commodity side. Fingers crossed. All right. Maybe be probably sort of it kind of <laughs> sums up the Federal Reserve yeah yeah it's really hard to predict what they're gonna do all right well Elaine Cub thank you so much for joining us this week thank you Mike that wraps up this edition of market to market but Elaine and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our market plus segment online you'll also find audio podcasts as well as streaming video of our program exclusively at the market to market website and be sure to join us next week when we'll examine how one western state is sorting out the details over water rights in light of the fourth straight year of drought. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.